Uh, today I want to talk to you um, about something the Lord laid on my heart. Uh, and I, I simply titled this sermon, Higher Living. Um, I, I love being a Christian. I don't know about you, but I enjoy uh, the rewards of Christianity. Uh, sometimes I don't always enjoy the challenges that comes along with my walk with the Lord. But I know those challenges are there to strengthen me and to make me stronger so I can do exactly what God has called me to do. And uh, as I talk about higher living, I do want to focus on uh, letting go of your past. I don't know about you, but I, I have a past, and my past is, is pretty profound um, just to see what God did with me. And I'll share a little bit about my testimony. Uh, I grew up in a family where we didn't go to church. So some of, some of us, I think Pastor David mentioned he had a drug problem growing up. His parents drug him to church almost every day of the week. I didn't have that drug problem. I had a different problem. We never went to church. And uh, it, it's pretty surprising that at the age of 15, I never heard about Jesus dying on the cross for my sins. I want you to think about that. Let that settle in. I never knew about uh, the sacrifice that he made for us. And I've shared this, and, and my sermon is not about speaking in tongues. Uh, but a little 15-year-old bad kid, I was really bad. I'll get into that a little bit in my sermon as well. But a 15-year-old kid who had never heard the gospel, who had never heard about Jesus dying on the cross for his sin, he's coming back from a vacation with his family, and all of a sudden he's speaking in a funny language. It wasn't Spanish. It wasn't French. I had no idea of what it was. But the hand of God, it reached down and it touched me. And I believe the hand of God reached down and touched me because God wanted to put me in a position where I could experience higher living. So with that, let's kick things off. In Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus is talking and he takes a very firm stance on his position with us and how we should focus our attention. Look at what he says in verse 62. Jesus replied, no one, I put on, that's my bad. He didn't say no on. He said no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to think about that. His stance is not only firm, but he's saying if we start this journey with him and if we continue to digress, if we continue to look back, that we are not fit for his kingdom. Why would Jesus take such a firm stance on this? He takes a firm stance, in my opinion, because he knows all of your attention has to be diverted and focused on him. Because when we're not completely dialed in, when we're not completely focused in, that's when we begin to waver and that's when we begin to do things that is not fit for what God has called us to do. So think about that. God is calling us. Jesus tells us that we need to wage war on our past. We need to wage war on Sin. I'm going to be sharing some very sensitive and personal stuff. Uh, please don't put this on social media. Uh, I'm just a very transparent individual. That's how I preach. That's how I talk. That's how I am. And let me tell you why it's important for us to wage war on sin and why it's important for us to wage war on our past. Uh, I remember I was, uh, I was saved. I was about 17 years of age. And uh, many of you know I am the youngest of nine. Many of you know I am the best looking in my bunch in my family. That's a given. You know that. Amen. And I remember um, my mother was challenging my brother, who was about 23, 24 years of age. Uh, my parents divorced when I was one, right? They, they divorced when I was one. And I was playing a video game or I was watching television, and my brother was getting into a lot of trouble. And my mother wanted to kind of bring him to realization. And she said, you know, uh, your life is headed in the wrong direction, young man. And, and I, I've heard this conversation before with my mom and my siblings. And she told my brother a story that I never heard before, and it hurt me. She said, you think you being like your dad is going to get you somewhere in life? She said, let me tell you a story about your father. But now let me give you some context before I tell you the story. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. My father was a womanizer. 
my father cheated on my mom numerous times, which led to the divorce. But now I go back to my story. My mother said, let me tell you a story about your brother, your, your dad. She said, your dad came home one day, and he was drunk. And he would always come home drunk. And I had my routine, and I went to take off your father's clothes to put him in the bed. And she said, this day, when I went to take his clothes off, his underwear was full of blood. Now, for the ones who don't understand what's going on, my dad had been involved with another woman, I don't know who she was, who was on her period. And it was the last straw for my mother. The reason why we have to let go of sin, the reason why we have to let go of our past, if we don't do it, it will destroy us. Sin destroyed my parents' marriage. And living in the past will destroy our life. Jesus tells us if we continue to put our hands to the plow and if we look back, we are not fit for God's kingdom. Let me tell you what I think. I think some of us, we look at our past, and it's just something that happened. It's just bad things back there that it's not a big deal. You know, I can live with them. I'm going to serve God, and God is saying absolutely not. We need to wage war on our past because sometimes it will cause us to become lethargic. Sometimes it will cause us to accept where we are, and we will never move forward with the things of God. You know, I've heard people tell me, you know, uh, yeah, uh, my family, we do struggle with some things. It, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, we, we gossip. It, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a part of who we are. Absolutely not. The Word of God tells us not to gossip. It tells us to build ourselves up and to encourage one another in the faith. Some of us may say, well, you know, I'll be honest with you. Uh, when I look at my life, I've always struggled with procrastination. Uh, I've always struggled with this. My marriage is okay, and, and it's not a big deal. We're faithful to each other, but our marriage is not strong. Absolutely not. God is calling us to not walk in mediocrity, but he's calling us to walk in his word. I believe when we become born again, I believe when we become bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, that God causes us to walk in excellence. He challenges how we think. He challenges our actions so that we can be the people that he has called us to be. How many people do you go? Give the Lord a round of applause. Amen. Amen. I don't want to go to a church where people are lethar lethargic and, and things are status quo. I want to go to a church where people are in love with Jesus, where people love life. I'm not saying everything that happens to me, I love it, but I choose to love life. You said, well, Pastor Marcus, you have a reason to choose to love life. You have a great job. I haven't always had a great job. I've shared with you guys when I worked two jobs, and they came in to turn off my cable. I was watching Matlock. You know, I was upset about that. <laughs> but even in the middle of my cable being turned off, I got the last three minutes of Matlock, and I chose to enjoy life. Moses had a past. I want to I focus a little bit about Moses, uh, and I want to talk about a situation and how he overcame his past. But I believe God calls us to give up our past so that we can receive what he has for us. He never calls us to give up something without receiving or going to something. So let's focus a little bit on Moses. We all know the story of Moses, and how God called him to the ministry. He has an interesting encounter in Exodus chapter 2 that I want to focus my sermon on today. Exodus chapter 2, uh, I want to start with verse 11. The Bible says, One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. This bothered him. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, Looking at this, or looking this way and that way, seeing no one. So it's about to go down. Can y'all get that? He's looking, he, he's trying to figure out, is anybody watching me? So he's about to do something. Looking this way and seeing, looking that way and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him 
in the sand. At this point, I want you to say with me, Moses has a pass. He has a pass. He did something that he had no business doing. I believe his heart was in the right place because he wanted to see, um, he, he wanted to see justice for his people, but he took matters into his own hand instead of giving God an opportunity to deal with it. So there are some really good things in that because he has a good heart. But how he acted or how he reacted and his actions were not justified in the eyes of God. Verse 13, the next day he went out, he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. So once it was revealed that Moses murdered somebody, the Bible tells us that he fled Egypt and he went out to the wilderness. You know, the one thing about our past is, um, specifically Moses, and then I'll talk about us, Moses was not only embarrassed, but he was ashamed of his past. And as a result of it, he fled. He left. And he spent many years out in the wilderness until God would eventually uh, walk him through what he needed to do. But my first point is, we need to learn to walk in the now and let go of our past. We have to learn to walk in what God has called us to walk in and let go of the things that we are embarrassed about, let go of the things we are ashamed of, let go of the things that would try to hold us back. I've shared this with many of you, but when I was a young boy, my father, he taught me how to use profane language. So like I was two years old and I had a vocabulary that was unbelievable. I'm serious. I said bad words. And he would encourage me to say bad words. Not only would he do that, right, that was wrong. Say that's wrong. Not only would he encourage me to do that, uh, my father had a candy store, and it was in our, our, our house. And so when people would come by, if a woman would come by, my dad would encourage me to touch them in places that's inappropriate for any man to touch in a woman without being married to her. I was two. And as a result of that, that became a part of who I was. So as I was growing up, 11 12, man, I use all kind of bad language. And let me share this with you. As Christians, we should not use bad language. Yes, yes. Pastor Marcus, are you saying you're perfect? Absolutely not. But what I'm saying is God is developing me. He's developing you. And we should work towards perfection. But we should not use terms and words that do not give glory to the kingdom of God. Pastor Marcus did it, man. I, before I got saved, good Lord, I, I had all kind of words. Like, I don't know if you've seen the videos where they would blurt out everything. If you followed my life, like half of it would be bloop, 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 because I was raised in that sort of environment. Also, since my dad taught me how to touch women, like, I thought that was a cool thing. I felt like that was okay. And at the age of 14, I was dating five different girls at the same time. All of their fathers should have collectively beat me up, <laughs> right? But, but that was a part of my past. So now when God saved me, he delivered me from that profane tongue. He delivered me from those lustful ways. Amen. Give God some praise. Now, I'm not saying I have never been in a situation where my mind is, oh, man, you need to go ahead and cuss them out immediately. No. Yeah, yeah. I, I, those thoughts, they've come. But God redeemed me. He saved me. Since the age of 15, when I had that encounter in that car, I've never used a word of profanity. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit, he came in. He saved me. He converted me. He changed my DNA. I'm not a mutant. But he changed my DNA, and he gave me a new tongue. He gave me a new language. He gave me a new way of speaking. And I walk in that. So I gave up cursing so that I can speak blessing. I love saying, Brother Keith, I love your faithfulness, brother. You're such a faithful man of God. Those are the types of words we should speak. I love saying, Sister Glenda, I appreciate your commitment to people 
who've been in prison and the way you love on them. They see the love of Jesus Christ in you versus some of the ways and some of the things I used to say. We have to give up our past to receive what God has for us. Now, I told you, like, I dated five girls at the same time when I got saved. I no longer had that desire in my heart. God delivered me from that lustful way of life. It was wrong. I want you to understand that. And God gave me holiness. He gave me purification. He gave me a life that I could be proud of. And from the age of 15 until the day I married Stephanie Oliver, I never touched a woman inappropriately. My wife and I, the three and a half years we dated, we didn't have sex. We waited until we got married so that we can honor God and our commitment to him. Amen. So, Pastor Marcus, what if I didn't live that life? What if I slipped? What if I fell? Well, even if you did that, go to God, ask him to forgive you, and ask God to give you a holiness and a desire for him. It's okay. As long as we repent, God will forgive us. Amen? So it's important that we learn to walk in the now and let go of our past. How did I let go of my past? I chose not to do those things. Was it a fight? Absolutely. I remember one time I was at Walmart and I was walking and I was, I was engaged to Stephanie. And about 40 yards away, I saw like five girls. They were all in bikinis. And I was with my buddy Chad. I won't tell you Chad's last name, but we're walking. I said, Chad, look down. He said, what? I said, look at your shoes. I'm walking. He's like, Mark, what? I said, look at your shoes. Chad didn't look at his shoes. Chad said, oh, my Lord Jesus. I said, look at your shoes. <laughs> look at your shoes, Chad. He's like, Jesus, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus, forgive me. Sometimes to walk in and now, you have to look at your shoes. Amen? Amen. So, amen. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or a new creature. Look at what he says. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Even though you may not feel like all things have become new, they're new. Even though you feel like those old things are there, they're weighing on you. They're reminding you of all of your failures. failures. Paul said all things have become new. We have to learn to take our past. We have to learn to take the things that we're ashamed of, the things that we've struggled with, and we have to learn to put them under the blood of Jesus. My, my old ways, they're under the blood of Jesus. I couldn't get it going to my marriage and be in my marriage and still be talking about what God delivered me from 25 years ago. Stephanie, you know, I used to cuss. Stephanie, you remember I had five girlfriends at one time. No, I couldn't do that. I'll tell you, when the Lord saved me, do you know what I did? I picked up the phone. I called every last one of them, and I told them I was wrong. I was dating you, and I was dating four other people. Now, man, you know, that's not the way you want to handle that situation. You just want to get out of it. Oh, look, I'm, we got to break up. I got to focus on my math. I mean, I'm, I'm struggling in calculus. You know what I'm saying? No, not only did God deliver me from that lifestyle, he needed me to confess those things. And I went through and I told them. And some of them, they were like hurt. I, had, I, I didn't want their daddies looking for me. I was, I was in the wrong. I should have been beaten up. But when he saved me, I became a new person. It wasn't that old Marcus who would try to lie his way out of it, right? It was that Marcus who now is going to take responsibility, that Marcus who was filled with God's Holy Spirit, that Marcus who wants to honor God in everything he does, right? Did I have a past? Absolutely. But I learned to give that past over to the Lord. When we look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Greek word for um, uh, old things uh, is, I'm, I'm going to pronounce this. If I mispronounce this, Brother Bob or Pastor David, y'all jump in. I believe it's parokomai. I believe that's the pronunciation. I listened to it uh, about 10 times, but Greek is not my language, amen. But it means that thing which has perished or something that has passed away. I want to say this. I think we have to learn to bury our past because if we don't take, make war on it 
If we don't bury it, it will come up and it will continue to challenge us. Uh, uh, back in 19, I believe it was 93, I was watching Christian TV, and this one man had been delivered from homosexuality, and the Lord delivered him. I'm sorry, the Lord saved him and delivered him. The Lord gave him a wife. The Lord gave him kids, and he was pastoring a church, and he was so thankful for his life. And he said the Lord spoke to him and told him, hey, I want you to share your testimony. Now, even though he was a pastor, he didn't share about his life because he didn't want people to ostracize him. And he told the Lord, I can't do that because the church would never receive me. Let me share this with you. And I'm going to say this. What I love about our church is the fact that it doesn't matter where people, what they've come from. It doesn't matter what they've been delivered from. As long as they love God, we will love on them, we will bless them, and we will accept them as a part of this family. Amen? Amen. If they were homosexual, right, if, if, if they were uh, somebody who lived in, in, in just heterosexual sins, sleeping with somebody without being married, if there's somebody who came out of racism, we will love on them. But when the Lord spoke to him and told him, I need you to share your testimony, he said, God, I can't do it. The church will never accept me. And when I think about us, there are so many testimonies that we have, but we are afraid and ashamed to share them because we don't know how people are going to receive it. God spoke to him and God told him, I need you to share what I've done for you. He says, God, I can't. I'm embarrassed. And the Lord spoke to him and the Lord told him, the thing that you are embarrassed about is the one thing I want to use in your life. I believe the things that we are embarrassed about are the things God wants to use because your testimony can be the difference in somebody saying, God, I'm going to follow you and I'm going to serve you. But our past needs to be buried. Our old way of life, it needs to be put away. So I'm going to go back to Moses. Moses had to deal with his past. So he went out to the wilderness. He met his wife. He had kids, and I want you to hear what happens in verse 18 of Exodus chapter 4. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, go, I wish you well. Moses still had that desire in his heart to serve God. He still had that desire in his heart to bring deliverance to the people of Israel, but let me show you what he did. He had that plow, right? God placed that dream in his heart, and I believe he was pushing forward. And when that situation happened with the Egyptian, he started, look, he started looking back. Now, it is so hard, Brother Nathan, to look at you and push this thing forward. But that's what we do. That's what we do. God is calling us to move forward in our marriages. He's calling us to move forward in our, family, our families. I don't know what family G's are. Probably a good word. I might, I might be able to put that in Wikipedia. I don't know. But he's calling us to move forward in our marriages. He's calling us to move forward in our relationship with him. So many of us, and when I say us, I don't mean like church. I mean the church in general. It is hard for me when a person tells me they're a Christian. I, like, it's hard for me to know if they are or aren't. Because so many of us who name the name of Jesus Christ, when I look at their lives, I can't differentiate between them and I don't know, some of these football players on Tennessee's team, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I lost y'all on that one. Georgia's team, how about that? But I'm being honest with you. I can't differentiate the Christians from the non-Christians. Because the Christians, sometimes you listen to their language, and it is just embarrassing. You look at how they look at other women while they're married, it is embarrassing. Why can't Christian men be faithful to their wives and not look at women who walk past them? I worked for a guy. He was, man, he was the plant manager. He was the top guy. And I thought he was a decent guy. He was a nice guy. And one day a, a lady who worked for him walked by. He looked down at her bottom, looked at me, and fanned his face. And I just thought, wow, that is so inappropriate. You are embarrassing your wife. So many of us, we accept these things. As men, we feel like, oh, well, you know, uh, it's okay to look as long as you don't act on it. No, it's not. Jesus tells us that what we see 
goes into our hearts. I've heard so many. I've heard dudes in church say, look, it's okay to look. That's how God made me. You, no, no, no. You, you got you to gotta work through that, right? And so Moses is at a place where he's willing to return back to the vision. And the whole point of Moses' life was to be a deliverer for the Israelites. That was his purpose, but I believe he got sidetracked when this situation happened, and he lost about 40 to 80 years. I'm not sure of what that number was, but I believe God started to deal with him, and he told Jethro, hey, I, I think I need to go back, and I think I need to fulfill this thing that God has placed in my heart. Look at verse 19. Now, the Lord has said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted you killed are dead. So Moses took his wife, his sons, he put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. Say Moses obeyed. He obeyed, right? His past was there to trip him up, to get him off course, right? And that's what the enemy wants from us. God, the enemy wants our past to trip us up. So we know the story. Moses went back. He obeyed the Lord. It was challenging. But overall, the Israelites, they prevailed. And it's all because he made a decision that his past would not define him. We cannot allow our past to define us. Number two, and I'll read Exodus 4.21. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. When I told you we have to wage war in our past, we're not waging war with just information. We're not waging war uh, with, with good intent or good insight. We're waging war because we are filled with God's spirit and we have been empowered to go out and to destroy the works of the devil. So my point number two, take hold of today and walk in God's plans and God's direction. So many of us, we, we not only get sidetracked, but we're looking so far ahead. Those motorcycles were moving. Did y'all hear those? <laughs> wow. But take hold of what God has for us today. I do my best just to focus on today. I can control what I do today. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Like, I, I, I don't know. And so, so many of us, we lose focus, and I believe the enemy's tactic is to spread us thin. Well, how are you going to get this thing done tomorrow? Well, what about next week? Well, what, what are you going to do next month? Do what you can do today, right? Moses wasn't concerned about, uh, I'm, maybe he was concerned about what happened when he went to Egypt or when he went to Pharaoh, but he had to go. When the Lord spoke to him, he couldn't control how Pharaoh was going to accept all of this, but what Moses did was he got on a donkey and he obeyed. For us, we have to learn to take it one step at a time. Pastor Marcus, how do I let go of my past? How do I do that? By focusing on what God has called you to do today. What has God called you to do today? I know what I got to do today. I got to go make me a ham sandwich and eat me a ham sandwich. I got to take my daughter to the airport. Amen. I got to get ready for work tomorrow. That, that's what I got to do. I can't be concerned about what's going to happen on Friday. So for us, right, the play is we need to focus on what has God called us to do today, right? And so let me, um, let me, let me just share a quick story. Um, when I first went to Oral Roberts University, I was really concerned about, like, being able to just pay the, 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 the tuition and the room and board. Um, I got loans. And I would, I would always concern myself with the next semester. Like, okay, all right, Lord, I got all of these loans. What am I going to do? How am I going to pay these back? How, how, how do I focus on, I, how do I get next year's paid? Like, what am I going to do? And the Lord just spoke to me and said, hey, don't worry about next semester. Don't worry about next year. Don't worry about your junior year. Just focus on today. Get through your studies, right? Something as simple as that. Get through your academics, right? Focus on what you can do today. And as I begin to focus on that, my mind will always digress and revert back to how am I going to pay these loans off? What kind of job am I going to have? And I would struggle with this time after time. 
And it took time for me to learn to just trust the Lord. And I got to the point where I said to myself, I can't focus on next year. <laughs> like the financial aid may not go through next semester. It's okay. Even if it doesn't, I'm still going to serve the Lord. Amen? So we have to learn to focus on what God has called us to do today. So point two, take hold of today and walk in God's plan and direction. Uh, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Uh, Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 12. This is what the Lord says. He's talking to the Israelites when they were uh, in captivity and in Babylon. Uh, what, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and I will fulfill my good purpose to bring you back to this place. Then he goes on to say, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. When we know that God has those plans, it's okay to say, I'm going to relinquish my past. It's okay to say, I'm going to let go of the things that have actually happened to me. Uh, I, I've shared so much with you, but I remember I had to give a speech in front of the CEO in Atlanta when I worked for Lear Corporation. And I felt like the, the speech was okay. Like I, I gave a presentation and I was talking so fast. Part of it was I was nervous. When he travels, he travels with the entourage, his entourage. And he looked at me and said, I didn't understand a word you just said. Do it again. Can you imagine your CEO saying, I didn't understand a word you just said, Keith. Say it again. Do it again. And, you know, at that point, like, you know, it is what it is. So I said the same thing. I just slowed it down a hair. He was like, that was great. Good job. Go get you a pop. I'm like, man, you are not in Michigan. <laughs> we don't say pop. Only Richard Riggs says pops, right? So, but he did, right? And, and for me, I could have taken that, and, and I could have become a little bit more nervous. I could have become a little bit more intimidated, right? I could have done all of those things, but it's okay. God is in control. Do you know if that CEO would have said, that Marcus is horrible. We don't need him. Get rid of him. God's still in control. Right? He would have opened up another door. And so often, we get caught up in who people are, what they think, right? It's okay. God is in control. We're going to walk in his ways, and we're going to allow him to move through us. But I like the fact that God has plans to prosper us. You see, higher living is not just surviving. It's not just figuring out how are we going to make it through how you're living says, because I serve God, he is going to go above and beyond anything I can ask, think, or imagine. I want us to get past this just enough mentality, right? I remember when I did my budget, when Stephanie and I got married, I said, Lord, I just need $1,300 a month. $1,300 allows me to pay my $500 rent. I'm serious. It allows me to pay my car notes. It allows us to pay our food and our mortgage and our life. That's what I need. And, and, and I, I needed two jobs to do that, right? And God taught me, hey, I'm a big guy. I can get you beyond just enough. And I believe as Christians, we're happy with just enough. And I'm not just talking uh, about dollars, guys. I, I'm going to talk about our marriage. Like, like, it's important to me that my wife and I, we have a good marriage. Like, I don't want her to say, oh, yeah, Marcus... He's a good husband. Uh, he provides. And uh, he speaks to me like, what? No, I want her to be happy. I don't want Jim Bob to come by and buy my wife roses, amen? I want to buy her roses. But we have to get past this just enough mentality. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, he says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. So I'm talking about relinquishing our past. I've said in order to get out of our past or to give up our past, we have to give it up for something. And God is telling us, focus on today. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. When I was driving down Highway 70, one of the churches they have on their billboard, worrying is believing that God will get it wrong. Like worrying is believing that God will get it wrong. And, and that's, that's how we, we see things, right? And so my third point is, know that God won't get it wrong. He, he's a good God. He's a big God. Uh, he will get it right, and he expects us, and he desires for us to learn to press through difficulties. 
I want to spend a little bit of time on this. I'm almost done. Press through difficulties. Let me tell you something I struggled with before I got saved. And even after I got saved, I struggled with this. And it took time for me to get past it. And it was pleasing people. Before I got saved, I was a people pleaser. I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to say good things about me. I didn't want people talking about me. And in high school, I was an athlete. I was a really good athlete. I was very, very popular. And it was important for me to keep up that facade, right, of people liking me, me always doing the right things to appear to be cool. Now, when I got saved, like, I don't know if you know this, but but being saved is the opposite of being cool. I don't, yeah, in high school, right? Because when I used to say profane words, when I used to tell them about all of the girls I dated back in high school, my wife didn't hear the first part of that sermon, so I had to say back in high school, back in high school, baby. Back in high school. But now that I tell them about Jesus, like these people, they look at you like you're an alien. But it didn't stop me because I learned to press through that. When people would say, man, he is a religious fanatic. Like that hurt. But I was proud of it because Jesus said, if you can't mention me in front of people, I can't mention you in front of my heavenly father. Man, I was in school. I was laying hands on folks. I was praying for folks. You know, the cool crowd, I don't know if you know this, but like in a cafeteria, and I went to a school of about 2,200 people, like the cool guys would wear their jackets and their sunglasses, and they would like stand against the wall, and people would look at them in awe, and I, I just, I thought, that's kind of crazy. So one day the Lord spoke to me, he said, go get your Bible, man, I grabbed my Bible, he said, go stand against the wall. <laughs> I stood against the wall, and I opened my Bible, and all those guys, they're like, oh, we are not going to stand here. <laughs> But I stood there, and I read my word. I said, I'm going to give God the glory. And even though they didn't get it then, a lot of those people, when I see them on Facebook now, they're giving glory to God. They're honoring God. Amen? Amen. We have to learn to press through difficulties. The Lord delivered me of what people thought about me. Right? Sometimes we, I mean, and and listen, don't get me wrong. It's important to me of how I'm perceived. I'm a leader in this church. I'm a leader in this community. It's important that you know my intentions with you and this church. They're right. My intentions with my wife is always honorable, right? But I, I can't, I can't, I can't succumb to nonsense. I can't succumb to ungodliness. The Lord delivered me from what people thought about me. And that is a great place to be. I can be free in preaching the gospel. I can be free in correcting things that are not right. Amen? And when they say, oh, I don't like him. He's this, he's that, he's the other. I just tell me, I love you. God bless you. I move on with my life because I have been delivered by the power and by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so I believe for Moses, he had to get delivered of what people thought about him. And we have to learn to walk in God's freedom and press through difficulties. A few more scriptures, I'm almost done. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 and 14, 12 through 14, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. Paul said, I'm still working towards what God has called me to. He says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of for me, past tense. So he's walking to take hold of what God has for him. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. We have to learn to forget. When that man said, I didn't understand a word you just said, say it again. I had to quickly forget it. I couldn't have a breakdown in that moment. You understand what I'm saying? And so as believers, it's okay. When you find yourselves in that situation, I take a deep breath. I've already prayed through it, and I just do what I know to do. And that's what we have to learn to do. When you're having an argument with somebody, if it's your wife, take a deep breath through it, let it go, and say, baby, you're right, and you move on. You press right through it, amen? We have to learn. We have to learn to forget. We do. And I know that's a struggle. I don't know about you, but when, when I do something that I'm embarrassed about, I replay it over and over again in my mind. I relive that thing. And as I'm reliving, reliving that thing, like the stress that I felt when I went through it, I relive and I, I reintroduce all of that stress back to my body, and it's not good for us. So we have to learn 
to press through those things. Uh, he goes on to say, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so as I close, uh, I do want to read a few more scriptures to you, but I want to say, you know, it's okay to trust God and it's okay to say, even though I made that mistake, I'm going to let it go. I don't have to relive it. And some mistakes are, are a little bit more challenging to overcome than others. Uh, but I believe as we trust God and as we get through it, I believe God rewards us. Let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you what I mean. So that same conversation I had with that CEO, um, I, I redid it. He told me to go get a pop. I was the only non-manager he invited to dinner that night. And I was the only person he asked, Marcus, how much money do you make? And I thought I was doing good. And I told him, oh, man, I make this. He's like, that's a shame. We're going to fix that. So I'm like, did they get me? Like, <laughs> should I have renegotiated my contract? <laughs> and that night I got a 40% raise. <laughs> Amen. Even though I had a mistake, even though he didn't like what I had to say, right? But God was working. God was moving. And anytime God is in the midst, Good things, great things are going to happen. Look at uh, what the author says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. We have to learn how to throw off our past. So for me, mentally, when it comes, I have to rebuke it. That's what I do. I rebuke it. Oh, uh, You remember when you, you made this comment or you said that? Yeah, but I was embarrassed. That was crazy. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. I walk in God's favor. I walk in God's blessings. I walk in what God has for me right now. The last verse I want to read, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. The Bible tells us, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It is important that we not grow weary and lose heart. And there have been some things in my life that's happened to me that I thought, man, this is going to be it. It's going to end me. But God's faithfulness sustained me, and God's faithfulness kept me in the fight. It is important that we know we can't just live with our past. We can't just let it linger. We have to wage war on it. And until we wage war on the things that are actively prohibiting or stopping us from following God, I believe we will continue to walk in mediocrity. And I want you to know what God says about mediocrity. He says, look, if you're going to serve me, I need you to be hot or I need you to be cold. He says, if you're going to be in the middle, then you might as well not serve me. Because God wants your undivided attention. He wants all of you. And that's why, like, when I talk and when I live, my life is passionate because I serve a risen Savior. When I talk about my marriage... My marriage reflects my salvation. It reflects my walk with God. It's pure. Nobody else has been a part of my marriage. Why? Because I want to honor God in everything I do. You say, Pastor Marcus, what if somebody else has been a part of my marriage? Then you repent. You plead that action or that event under the blood of Jesus Christ, and you walk in God's best. Just because you've made a mistake don't mean you, you can't be passionate. I've made plenty of them. My wife will tell you I've made plenty of mistakes but I walk in what God has for me. And I know I'm closing. I got a couple more statements. I'm not the smartest on my job. I'm not the most talented on my job. But I am favored on my job. I am favored in my marriage. I'm favored with whatever I do because I give my now to the Lord. Close your eyes. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord God, that sins are being forgiven. Forgiven. I thank you, Lord God, that genera generational curses are being broken. I thank you, Lord God, that hearts are being mended. Dreams and visions are being restored. Lord God, I thank you that we will live in what you've given us right now. Lord God, I thank you that we will walk in what you've given us right now. Lord God, I ask you to forgive us of our sins. I ask you, Lord God, to forgive us of the things we've done. And Lord God, I thank you that today we will bury our past. Right now, I just want you to visualize what are some things that have held you back mentally, 
spiritually, physically, that's in the past. And I, I want you to see yourselves literally just taking those and burying them. Let's bury them at the foot of the cross. For so many of us, that past is just, it's so apparent. And we feel like we can't get past what we did or what others did to us. But God is saying, you can, you can do it. God is saying, I'm for you, I'm not against you. And he just wants us to relinquish that right now in Jesus' name.